Hello, and welcome to a special edition of FAQ. Now, if you've been watching for a while, you know that Ty, Danae, and I are uh, very interested in science communication, and we're always looking around for new videos and new pieces of, of educational content that are coming out on the scene. And we ran into a video created by Cleo Abram and Marquez Brownlee on quantum computing, and we thought this could be a really interesting thing to sort of react to and to bring in one of our resident expert, physics experts, uh, to help react to this, Stefan Leichenhauer. Yeah, so Hello. hi, Stefan. Hi, Adam. And, you know, let's just give away the punchline up front. Our verdict after watching this video is... We liked it. We like it. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good. But we want to get into it a little bit deeper than just saying it was a great video because yeah. um, you clicked on this. So you want to hear more about it. So uh, what I thought we'd do is just uh, kind of watch through a couple of clips and, and have uh, Stefan react to that. What do you think, Stefan? You up for it? Yeah, sounds good to me. Great. All right. Well, let's get it going. Quantum computers aren't supercomputers. They aren't bigger, faster versions of what we use now. There's something totally different. And that difference is actually the key to understanding why they're such a big deal. So I really, I really like uh, the comments that Cleo opens with, the uh, the fact that quantum computers are, you know, they're different. They do different things, and most explanations are not only confusing but often wrong. Um, I mean, I'm I'm happy to say that the explanations that they have in this video are, I think, neither confusing nor wrong, um, especially when compared with, you know, most of what's out there. But this is like a really good sign that this point is being made up front. Yeah, I totally agree. And especially that they're not just like faster, regular computers. Like I like that they made that, that, that point. Too, exactly. That that's a exactly. very common area of confusion. Okay. Here's the analogy that helps me understand what quantum computers are good for. The thing that he said was really important to understand is that quantum computers are not faster cars. They're boats. A boat is not necessarily better than a car. They're just built for totally different terrain. So with our new quantum computers, we're beginning to navigate these new mathematical waters, solving problems and discovering areas that traditional computers just can't. So I don't know who you know their, the expert was that she spoke to, but mm -hmm. whoever it was, kudos to them because yeah. I think they delivered the message. They delivered like a really good message. Um, it's. You know, I am also often frustrated by explanations of quantum computers and quantum technology and what it does. And I think this is this is actually a really good analogy, I would say, for trying to get across the message, right? It's not a faster car, it's a boat. It just lets you do new things that you could not do otherwise. I mean, as far as analogies go, that's pretty good. And I also like it because one of the problems I usually have with analogies is that they often make you think they, they, they it's really easy using an analogy to conclude something that isn't true just because you take the analogy too, too far. I think you this analogy is nice because we're a little bit protected from that because it's just obviously an abstract analogy, right? Nobody out, nobody thinks that a quantum computer is literally a boat. So it, uh, I think it's, it's actually a really good one and I may steal it and use it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> it reminds me of something I think you've heard, I, I've heard you say before, <clears throat> which is not only are quantum computers like a different thing entirely, but there are some problems that you probably would not want to use a quantum computer for, exactly. and it would just make it worse. And that makes sense. Like if I want to travel. Exactly. If you, you want know. to go to the top of the mountain, you wouldn't use the boat. Yeah. <laughs> you don't um, want to use a You know, you drive it. up the mountain, that's fine, but yeah. you don't take the boat. I think if there's one thing that people... If there's one takeaway from the video that I would want people to take away and that they probably do take away, it's the message of this analogy. I think it's a really good, then I think in the ways that they try to extend it both now and later on, I think are all valid and, um, and it's a good one. I, you know, official endorsement. So all of these cables that you see here on the side carry signals down through the fridge into the processor and then they do their their quantum stuff and it comes up and it goes to these room temperature control electronics and they turn it into things that humans can understand. 
So I think this is a really interesting point is that the, it's not just a quantum computer. <laughs> like this is a mix of quantum computing and classical computing in order to get actual work done. Um, what do you think of that, Stefan? Yes, absolutely. I think there are a couple of interesting points here. First, I'm pretty sure everything that was actually shown on camera is the non-quantum part. Like everything that we can, act, and all the pictures that you normally see of this, you know, golden chandelier, um, that's the, you know, refrigerator technology plus the cables, as they were saying, to, 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 to transmit si classical signals uh, back and forth. Um, but the, the actual quantum computer itself, I mean, you can see, you know, the actual quantum part, you can see images of in research papers and things. It looks like a, I mean, it, look, it, it looks almost like any other circuit board if you just look at it. But um, it's, uh, it's a tiny thing that's sitting at, well, at, at the bottom of this refrigerator mechanism. Uh, but the refrigerator mechanism certainly looks cool. I think it's also worth, uh, worth mentioning that in this video, they're talking about one kind of quantum computer, right? Like this is the kind of quantum computer that IBM is building which is based on superconducting circuit technology, which is why it has to be so cold, et cetera. Superconductors function at low temperatures, very low temperatures. Um, but that's not the only way to build a quantum computer. And not all quantum computers look like this. Uh, not all quantum computers have to be cold. So it's, it's, yes, this is a quantum computer, but it's not, you know, the quantum computer. Uh, there are different different kinds, and some would look very different. Some could be smaller, some could be bigger uh, in terms of the, you know, apparatus required to, to f make it function. Uh, but this is a particular kind, superconducting, uh, superconducting circuit based. And we've talked about some of those before on, on the FAQ uh, podcast, and we'll be doing more of that later. But these are things like photonic um, supercomputers, neutral atom, ion trap. Uh, there's there's a bunch of other ones. Uh, that's that's what you're what you're kind of getting at. Exactly. Right stuff, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Great. Yeah. No, that's a great point. It is it comes down to bits, and bits are made out of pieces of silicon, and you have you know tens of thousands to millions of them in your computer. And they can either be in the state zero or one. We call it the ground state or the excited state. A quantum computer is run on qubits. So I appreciate that they're making the point, even before getting to the quantum part, that, um, I mean, it, was, it went by very quickly, but they, they made the point that bits are physical things. Like there's little pieces of silicon inside the computer that are doing something. And, you know, the thing that they're doing, we, we, we give labels to it and we say it's, oh, it's zero or one or something like that. Um, when you actually get into, the, get into the heart of what makes a computer work, of course, there's physical processes going on. And, and it's true that it's not something that's really appreciated by people. Um, I kind of like the point of like, you know, to begin an explanation of how a quantum computer works by saying, well, you know how a classical computer works. <laughs> It really does assume, assume quite a lot. You know, you like what's a qubit? Well, first, you know what a bit is, right? Um, right. Oh, and, and if funny. you don't, it's just a zero or a one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that's supposed like to help. That, yeah, I think in reality, it's just saying it's a zero or a one helps nobody if you've never yeah. if you've never heard of it or thought about it before. Qubits aren't like bits. They aren't a one or a zero. They're more complex. Think of this like a wave. A qubit could be really likely to be zero, which means a lower energy wave. Or it could be really likely to be one, which means a higher energy wave. And each qubit has a probability of being each. When a quantum computer is working, the probabilities of multiple qubits interact. And they add constructively or destructively, just like waves would. If you were to like tap like two places in a pond. I don't have a really amazing best explanation for what a qubit is. But I feel like, as we were saying before, when if you're trying to explain a bit and you just say, oh, it's a one or a zero, that doesn't really help too much. I feel like saying, well, a qubit is like a low energy wave or a high energy wave is kind of like that. It's, it's not transmitting as much, uh, you know, pedagogy as one would hope. I mean, the, the, 
adding, you know, being able to add waves together and get interference and things like that. It makes for nice pictures, at least if you've seen it before. I think if someone was unfamiliar with waves, it'd be hard to hard to get at it. But it's, I think there's a lot of work being done here by assuming that somebody knows a little bit about about waves and then just saying, well, a qubit, it's like a wave. Yeah, and I think Ty Dene, you and I talked for like 45 minutes in our first episode about bits and qubits. And I don't remember us talking yeah. about waves in particular, but even after those 45 minutes, I think we were hoping that the audience like had a better idea of how things work yeah. and they, they're trying to condense it here into a minute or so. Yeah, yeah. Although, can I, can I ask Stefan two things about this? Number one, although maybe the wave description isn't um, completely illuminating if you're kind of like, why, like where did waves come from? Um, I, is, isn't it better, Stefan, than the typical explanations, which are a bit is a zero and a one, blah, blah, blah. A qubit is something oh, that can absolutely. be both zero and one at the same time. Like that's what I was expecting to hear actually at this part of the video. And I was pleasantly surprised to not hear those words. No, absolutely, absolutely. No, thanks for the thanks for grounding me a little bit. No, yeah, this I, I I'm very much nitpicking here when I say, well, yeah. maybe yeah. waves isn't the best way to do it, but a it's way better than the usual alternative, which is to say, oh, it's both at the same time or or whatever, like because yeah. that's that's you know nonsensical really, um, and b like I said, I don't really have a perfect th way to do it myself like if i was gonna usually if pushed uh when it comes to these kinds of concepts concepts of superposition i'll often just punt and say there is no way to explain it and uh and just try to you know give the properties of what it means like when we like to not define it in terms of something we already know but to define it by saying how it's used mm -hmm. um and I mean, in a sense, that's kind of a purist way of doing it. But it's also, um, if if you if you're not going to do that, and that, you know, I, I don't blame you for not doing that. Uh, an explanation like the one they gave is is probably as good as you're going to do. My question is, as the controller of the computer, you decide what about those probabilities. Basically, you are altering the probabilities while you're running an algorithm. It's a common misconception that quantum computers try all the options. That's not right. This is simplified, but it's more like a quantum computer kind of watches the pond. It watches how all of those waves interact and then finds the most likely answer. So I really loved that Marquez asked that question that he asked. That's a really good question that nobody ever asks, especially somebody who's like new. Like you control what about the probabilities? That's a really actually insightful question that, and the answer was also a good answer. And the way that they were explaining it, like I never see it explained properly in, uh, you know, in popular media, um, you know, trying all options at once is language that you often hear. Even experts when they're being sloppy will use language like that, but it's not good language. This. Pond analogy is actually another really good analogy, right? Like we should not take it literally. I don't think it's one that people are going to be taking too literally. There's not a literal pond inside of the, inside of the uh, quantum computer there. But the idea that, okay, there are these waves, okay, abstract waves, fine. And maybe that's hard to, maybe that's hard to think about. But given that there are these waves and they, you know, ripple across, if we imagine them as, as if they were rippling across the pond, they, you know, add up and they, you know, make the pond spike up in different places. And yeah, what we can control is how we poke the pond. Um, and then things, things happen and we just watch what happens. If I were to add more to this analogy of the pond, what I might say is, um, in a quantum algorithm, like a good or well-designed quantum algorithm to answer a question, uh, you might say, well, I know that if I poke the pond in a particular way, I will create some waves and somewhere in the pond, because of how I poked things, somewhere in the pond, 
the water will spike up to a really tall height. Um, and all I need to do is watch the water and see where it spikes up. And the location of that spike, of that especially high wave, that'll give me the answer to my problem. It'll be encoded in where the spike is on the wave. Is it on the, in the north? Is it in the southeast? You know, where exactly does it happen? And just knowing where to poke it doesn't, I, I have no way of figuring out where the spike will happen. Um, I just have to do it. And then I know the spike will happen somewhere, but I need the quantum computer, in this case, the pond, to tell me where it happens. And that gives me the answer. Here's how Olivia put the dream of how we'd actually use quantum computers. It's beautiful because, like, of course, we all want to make the world a better place. We want to develop technology that's going to enable us to do fundamentally different and better things. But it's also beautiful because, like, part of the human experience is you just want to, like, learn what we are and, like, learn more about the world we live in. And the fact is the world is quantum mechanical. There you have it. Thanks for coming. Peace. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask Stefan, what did you think about that takeaway? But I guess the applause explains it. Yeah. No, it's, um, no, I, I, I loved it. It's really good. The, you know, this is another fact, actually, the final message there is another fact that I think people rarely appreciate, which is that quantum, you know, quantum physics in general is not actually an exotic thing that only happens in certain areas. Everything is actually quantum mechanical. And if you care about, you know, knowing how things actually are and how the world works and all of that, then you should care about, about quantum. And quantum computers are just, um, just using, it's just using that knowledge and exploiting it. And it's helping us learn more about that aspect of, of reality. I think that's a... Awesome. <laughs> Thank yeah, go ahead. Adam. No, I think that's a great a great takeaway. And quantum computers are just one aspect of um, how we can use quantum mechanics to better understand our universe. There's all sorts of other ways uh, as well. Um, but yeah, I think that that was a, a great takeaway. I want to encourage everybody to actually go watch the video that we just uh, reacted to. We'll put a link in the description below. And uh, Ty Danae, any any parting thoughts from you? No, I thought that was great. Thank you so much, Stefan, for taking the time to join me and Adam today. This was fun. Yeah, it was great. Loved it. Thanks for having me.